Welcome, everybody. Now you can uh, This is the plenary India, Greece, and the World Economic Outlook. And I'm Jessica Cantor, journalist and international communication strategist. And I am joined by these excellent gentlemen to speak about the, um, the World Economic Outlook with special regards to India and Greece. With India's GDP exceeding growth expectations and the Greek economy witnessing significant improvements, the economic outlook for these two countries looks positive. However, there are still disruptions following the financial management of the pandemic, which continue to depress global economics, and volatility remains high due to ongoing live conflicts. Will the Eastern economies, especially Indian, rise more than Western ones into 2025? What are the geopolitical challenges facing Greece as policymakers set long-term productivity targets? What changes will the U.S. elections yield? We'll be addressing these questions and more in today's plenary. Welcome and thank you for joining us. And I'm joined by Tassos Anastasatos, Group Chief Economist of Eurobank from Greece, Dimitri Avramopoulos, a former EU Commissioner and former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Greece and former Mayor of Athens, Shashir Priyadarshi, for, er, president of Chintin Research Foundation in India, and Anil Wadwa, former secretary of the Ministry of External Affairs in India. Thank you for joining us. So let's start with having just some presentations from you individually, and perhaps if you want to also introduce yourselves and your expertise a little bit more. Sure. Would you like to begin? Good morning. Thank you for the uh, invitation. My name is Tasso Anastasados. I'm the chief economist <coughs> of the Eurobank Group. As you probably know, we're very active uh, in, in India, and therefore uh, we follow the uh, economy very closely. So I'll try to give some context, the macroeconomic context uh, of the global economy uh, developments, and with some focus to the respective economies of India and Greece in, the first, in my first remarks, and then I'll leave the, uh, the remainder for, uh, for our time here. So um, the global economy is, is undergoing uh, a, a series of very important and very uh, quick uh, changes uh, this, uh, this time. Uh, and this uh, year in particular is characterized by slow growth, especially uh, in uh, developed economies. The monetary policy has been very restrictive, as you know, in the previous years. It has managed to curb inflation, which is uh, going mm -hmm. to the direction of the target of 2%. Uh, slowly, perhaps in the, in the next uh, years, uh, driven by a de-escalation in goods uh, inflation, while service inflation remains a bit sticky. Um, uh, and given that labor markets uh, continue uh, to loosen. However, the price of monetary contraction uh, has been to uh, brought down uh, the economy and economic activity to a slowdown. The U.S. Uh, is now slowing, having uh, coped better in the previous uh, year than the Eurozone economy. We expect the U.S. economy uh, to decelerate 2.5 percent this year, and perhaps below uh, 2 percent in 2025. Uh, in, uh, in the Eurozone, however, growth will remain very slow, very sluggish, below 1 percent for this year as well, as was the case in 2023, and to accelerate only mildly, mildly above 1 percent in the, uh, the next year. And even more importantly, Growth in the Eurozone is expected to remain uneven uh, among sectors uh, and uh, between uh, regions. Um, this picture of slowing growth and decelerating inflation gives the uh, degree of freedom to, to uh, central banks uh, to undertake cuts uh, in, the, uh, in the main uh, rates. Uh, and uh, the general picture is that the economy, due to these cuts and some laxity in the fiscal policy, uh, will remain soft this year, but broadly resilient. That is, no recession in uh, both the U.S. Uh, and the European economy. However, uh, the picture uh, has many risks uh, involved. Uh, let me mention the few uh, that I consider to be the more prominent. One has already been mentioned by, by Jessica. It has to do with the election uh, in the uh, U.S. In the short term, we expect no impact, considering that especially the monetary policy uh, has committed, has pledged not to be affected by political developments. However, in the longer term, and contingent on some changes in trade, immigration policies, uh, on uh, perhaps tariff policies, uh, contingent on the result of the uh, election, it is possible that we'll have see some repercussions in the inflation, in output and uh, uh, employment, not just in the US, but also globally. Uh, we expect uh, some spillovers 
to the respective economies uh, as well. Uh, uh, not to forget to mention that the fiscal deficit as well is expecting the U.S. to remain high, no matter which party uh, uh, is uh, electing president in the November election, and this is going to have some spillovers as well. Second risk has to do with the limited ability of the fiscal policy to support growth, uh, given that, especially in the Eurozone, we are again uh, going towards fiscal prudence after the laxity of the pandemic uh, period and the new uh, fiscal compact being uh, in place. And thirdly, there are several sectors, most prominently the real estate sector, but not just that, that feel some pressures. We see increased uh, bankruptcy rates and defaults uh, that exceed pre-pandemic levels in several countries, and this poses risks to financial uh, stability. However, these conjectural, let's say, changes are intertwined with some longer-term changes that take place, and I consider them to be of historical proportions. Uh, very, uh, very briefly, uh, the most uh, important trend I see has to do with the uh, decline in the relative power of Western economies in the sense of uh, the gap with per capita GDP shrinking with comparison to uh, emerging uh, Asian powers, uh, India being prominent among, uh, among them, and also Western countries being burdened by high public and private <coughs> debts. Uh, by unfavorable uh, demographics and also by polarization within their societies uh, uh, due to cultural issues uh, being uh, debated, including human rights, immigration, security. Uh, Western societies have to cope with increases in uh, defense spending, uh, which obviously will have some cost in other areas of spending, and trends uh, that uh, pose towards deglobalization or at least nearshoring. Uh, Western economies tend to uh, be less uh, willing to rely on remote and geostrategically unstable allies and turning towards uh, internalizing the production or uh, near shoring to friends, which to a uh, longer term uh, horizon will increase stability but will have the cost of increased inflation and possibly slower growth. Uh, add to that uh, the uh, risk related to climate change and the costs uh, to the green transmission, uh, transition uh, and the uh, risks related to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence may promise to increase productivity in the very long term, but at the same time uh, creates risks of uh, uh, upheavals, uh, ethical dilemmas and security risks. Now, the political difficulty of implementing reforms to cope with all these challenges uh, means that the risks of stagnation to the medium and longer term are, are, are here uh, present. But it's not just risks, it's also opportunities, especially for, for countries such as Greece and India. In the case of uh, Greece, we're talking about the economy that is recovering dynamically uh, from the debt crisis period, uh, overperforming the Eurozone in terms of growth for many years, expect to continue uh, in terms of uh, 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 a, an increased investment program uh, fueled by the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Funds, and uh, an extensive structural reform envelope uh, that was implemented in previous years. In the case of India, we're talking about a very dynamic economy with a big internal market, reforms, building of institutions, investments in human and, uh, uh, and material capital, and all this uh, resulting uh, not just in dynamic growth now, but we expect it to be 6.8% this year alone, but most importantly, sustained uh, high uh, growth rates in excess of 6% for the next two decades. This is our main indication. So, considering that Greece, from one hand, is the gateway uh, to, to, to Asian markets uh, uh, due to its geographical position, and Indian having the dynamism, I think there is a lot of scope for common work uh, of the two uh, economies. Just to throw a number to fuel the discussion, uh, the uh, bilateral trade between the two countries from 2 billion uh, an average between 22 and 23 is expected to uh, be doubled to 4 billion by 2030, let alone uh, the uh, incremental change to be caused by the IMEC uh, initiative. So I just leave it here as uh, as uh, as a spare of discussion regarding the potential, and uh, perhaps we we'll have time to get back to that again. Wonderful, thank you, Tassas. Very enlightening. Minister, would you like to share your thoughts? First of all, I would like to take the torch from Tassos, he covered the whole spectrum of, uh, of economy. But let's move now to another issue. Let me, well, I was introduced before, I 
because since two years ago, uh, the European Commissioner for Migration, Security and Counterterrorism, the so-called Home Affairs in general, and before, member of the Greek government in defense, uh, foreign affairs, uh, health, and major events. So today, we're here to share our insights on uh, what can contribute in fostering and deepening the relations between India and uh, Greece. Greece and India had always good relations at all levels and strong historical bonds that date back to the era of Alexander the Great. So we're more than happy to host this event. I'd like to congratulate uh, Horace and Mr. Richter for having organized this uh, event, which is the beginning of a new era in the relations between the two countries. As I told before, I was responsible for migration and security during the last six years. Actually, it was the beginning of a new adventure for the European uh, Union, because let's go straight to the point. Today, Europe is in a very precarious situation, given the fact that uh, migration and the security concerns had defined the internal relations between member states. I still remember that uh, five months after my arrival in Brussels, I was the lucky one, since I was the responsible commissioner, to see and uh, to see firsthand the very first uncontrolled flows uh, of migrants in Europe and the very first terrorist attacks. But believe me, to build from scratch the European agenda on migration and security, it was not the easiest thing. Why? Because, as you know, Europe is not a federal system. It's, like, it's not like the United States. So all member states still give priority to their national interests. So to start exchanging information on counterterrorism or to put together uh, the interests of all these countries re related to migration, it was not, as I told you, leave it. It works, okay? Okay. It's better there. Uh, well, um, and uh, I also would like to remind you that Brexit had uh, as main reason migration. On migration, populists have built their narrative. And as you see, now they gain more ground, especially in Europe. And this is very dangerous for the European project because the basic principles upon which Europe is built, solidarity and responsibility, are in danger. Why do I say that? Because it was the moment for the European member states to show more solidarity among them. The countries of first entry, as it is Greece, Italy, Malta and Cyprus, still suffer. And coming to our days, I can tell you that this new pact that was signed in Brussels, given the position, the decision taken by the German government today, put in danger the most tangible uh, example of European integration, which is Schengen Zone. If it happens, it will, this will be a disaster for, for Europe. So, European leadership at national and at European level, they have to do more in order to avoid this from happening. That would lead Europe, I'm sorry to say that, to the dark pages of its history. Because together with populism, we have nationalism. And this is a very dangerous mix. You can see it in Southeast Europe. You can see it now even in Central Europe. Given the precarious situation on a global uh, scale with what's happening in the Middle East and uh, Central Europe with the war um, uh, between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine and some other hotspots around the world uh, define the future of the world. And there you can see in this larger picture the relations between Europe and India and Greece, uh, between Greece and uh, India. Now coming to migration. Europe needs migrants because Europe is an aging continent. It's not the case of India. We do not have young people in, uh, in, in Europe anymore. So, I believe, and this should be one of the conclusions of this meeting, that an agreement should be signed between the European Union and India, because I know that a lot of Indians would like to work in Europe. And on the other hand, Europe needs all these very well-educated um, Indians who can really contribute 
to the efforts made by Europe. And then we have investments. As I said before, it is very important for the businessmen of, um, um, of India to be inspired to invest in Europe and in Greece. But in order to achieve it, we need a more flexible, hospitable investment environment. So it is our duty, especially in Greece, to fight bureaucracy, which is one of the main obstacles for doing business in this country. This government has done a lot. And as it was said before, the recovery of the Greek economy uh, after the economic crisis is commendable, no doubt about it. But we have to do more in the future. So, by describing this situation in general terms of what is happening in, uh, in, my, in, uh, in this area regarding migration, uh, we can really discuss it later on. And then we have tourism. Maybe you don't know, but uh, my very first ministerial post was Minister of Tourism. Actually, I had founded the Ministry of Tourism. Greece has a great expertise and know-how on tourism. This can be shared with our Indian friends. Uh, there we have a lot of things together. But when we talk about tourism, it's not only in economic terms. It has to do with environment and with culture. All these three uh, elements stick together in order to adopt a strategy for the future. But tourism, as I was telling Jessica before, is also a tool for international diplomacy and relations. Because the more people know each other, the more understand each other, and they more respect each other. In this globalized uh, uh, world we live, we need people to start contributing in what we call public diplomacy. This will neutralize nationalist trends. So it has to be seen in a totally different way. And this is something that Greeks have realized a long time ago. So shared experience in tourism and, of course, the, uh, tackling migration. And then the last but very important sector. You know, Greece is a, a very important global stakeholder in shipping. I know what are the needs of India on that. And there, the Greek shipping industry can do a lot in sharing expertise and know-how. But we have to stick together and cooperate in a spirit, of course, of mutual trust. And this is the world that will define the future of the relations between Greece and India. We have everything supporting this cooperation. It is up to us now, at all levels, governmental, um, banks, shipping industry, to start talking to each other in a very sincere and frank way. Greece can be the gateway of India to Europe and Southeastern Europe at all levels. And now, since India is emerging as a global stakeholder at all levels, from a geostrategic, geopolitical and economic point of view, India needs partners of good trust, and we are here for that. So, these are some uh, scattered thoughts in order to start our discussion. And I'd like to thank Jessica for coordinating this uh, uh, debate and again, Mr. Richter, for having set up this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And you're right, we're going to want to touch on some of those topics a little more heavily later on. Shashir, would you like to share your thoughts? <clears throat> Jessica, thank you. And uh, thank you to both my earlier panelists. Uh, Yes, I am uh, president of the Chintan Research Foundation at the moment, but I've spent about 25 odd years with the World Trade Organization. And I want to share one particular experience in the context of that, which I think could have an important bearing for the way <clears throat> we would like the Indo-Greece relationships to progress. What I saw amongst the 160 odd member countries of the WTO was that political relationships between two countries will open doors. But the extent to which each country walks through that door once that door is opened depends on economic relationships. It is an economic relationships between two countries which will determine the sustainability of the relationship. So yes, you do need the initial political goodwill, but to maintain that, Polit political goodwill will not be enough, and you will need a sustained economic relationship. 
Now, if you look at it, and both are absolutely, both are necessary conditions, you know, you know one can't do without the other. Politically, yes, we've been all talking about uh, the relationship that India and Greece have had for decades. But I do not think there is any doubt that the kind of level of political camaraderie, the political friendship that exists at the moment between the two countries has not existed before. You know, again, since yesterday we've heard the fact about this, you know, uh, the visits of the two heads of state. Um, I have a very, very experienced ambassador, Indian ambassador on the right, so he'll correct me. But I do not think, at least I don't recall ever in the past that in six months, heads of states individually have visited each other. You know, August 2023 to February 2024, we had it. But the point that I would really like to, you know, draw your attention to, and that's what probably we diplomats are trained to do, to read what is said in a speech, but to also read what is not said in a speech. And I did go over what the Greek Prime Minister said on both occasions. In August 2023, when the Indian Prime Minister was here, and I quote just one bit of, uh, of what he said, he talked about intensifying the transnational economic contact. Sure, you're building the place, you do need this transnational economic contact. He talked about the FTA between Greece and Europe. But importantly, as uh, you've just said, he also said that Greece can become the economic energy, economic, comma, energy and trade bridge, interestingly, he said, between three continents. So he was not just referring to Asia and Europe, he was probably also referring to Africa in a way that this could also be. Did he talk about IMEC in that statement of his? He did not. And now you fast forward about six months when the Greek Prime Minister visits India in February of 2024, he specifically speaks about IMEC. So obviously things have distinctly moved because at that point of time, you know, just that being the gateway, what, we, uh, what was mentioned has now transformed into saying that Greece can actually be India's gateway to Europe in the context of IMEC. And Jessica, the reason I raise this as the first point is since yesterday, in fact, there was a preliminary um, a plenary session yesterday also, in which I think all the five speakers talked of IMEC. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a lot of positivity, there is a lot of positive uh, feeling and intention towards IMEC, but it also comes with a catch. This has raised expectations of delivery. We may have the sustained period of, you know, feeling, yes, IMEC would open corridors and ensure that the Greek and Indian relationship go on to a next level. But unless and until IMEC delivers very quickly. So in the context of IMEC, you probably not only need to harvest, as they call, the, you know, the low-hanging fruits, but you've got to combine it also with the highest yielding fruits. It's not just low-hanging fruits. You've probably got to combine it. And I think one of the factors, or probably two, uh, that were mentioned, and maybe I can talk about it now or later, ports and people. I'm, I'm calling that together, ports and people. Ports, I mentioned very briefly yesterday also, really have to be looked at not as just part of logistic corridors, but genuinely as centers of economic development. And within ports, uh, Jessica, what I have kind of would like to share is every single port, in my view, really needs to be a hub of four elements. You need to have these four elements in any port, whether in India, whether en route, whether in Greek, whether even in Italy, which is uh, one of the signatories of, uh, of IMEC. It needs to be a logistic hub. Absolutely clear about that. So it needs to be, there needs to be a port, there needs to be railway lines, there'll obviously be connection to the highways, it will open up the hinterland. But in addition to the logistic hub, it also needs to be an energy hub. Because any port today, especially as part of a corridor, will be, has to be relevant 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And it has to provide an energy corridor too. The important point about an energy corridor is that very often, the countries which are part of a corridor 
have their peak requirements of energy at different times. So energy corridor is probably one corridor which during the course of 24 hours will see a two-way traffic. So if you had renewable energy plants next to it, because energy is not just going to be the traditional fossil fuel, it's obviously got to be renewable. And if it's got to be renewable, then you've also got to think of electrolyzers and green hydrogen. Then you've also got to think of greening the port and greening the ships which pass through the port. So the second is obviously the energy hub. Technology hub. Every single port's got to be devised for the future. The kind of AI technology, the kind of every kind of technology we use in port operations, and India is doing that. India is doing it in one of the, its western ports, which is probably the largest port. But finally, and I think that's the point that was being made in the context of migration, these ports have also got to be people's hub. Firstly, for people living there, till you do not ensure that these are completely fully functional and comfortable townships, you're not going to get people. But migration would be a very, very important factor in ensuring, the, again, the long-term sustainability of this contact. And I started with WTO and I'll end with WTO. For years in WTO, countries like India were told, reduce your trade barriers because that would permit a more efficient factor of production to come into your country. Reduce your barriers because you know, the, the classic uh, um, uh, 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 Baldwin theory, reduce your barriers, more efficient production of goods. So goods were regarded as factors of production and countries were encouraged, sometimes more than gently, to reduce their barriers. And yet when the reverse was put, that also reduce your barriers to the movement of people because they are also factors of production. The answers were much more stronger in the negative. And if a relationship between two countries has to be strengthened and looked at long term, in addition to ports, in addition to corridors, in addition to finance, you also got to get people's mobility. I'll stop here. Thank you, Shashir. And yes, let's talk a lot more about IMAC and a lot of its challenges and solutions, but you've brought up a lot of really amazing points right there. Anil, would you like to share your thoughts? Thank you very much. It's, a, it's an advantage sometimes to speak at the end because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of points have been thrown up and I think I'll fill, up, fill all the gaps which, have, which I feel uh, are there, uh, which remain and something which needs to be discussed also in detail. Um, first of all, you know, the economies of both India and Greece, of course, it's a given that they're on the upswing. There's a lot of confidence in India, uh, mainly because of the fact that there is an expectation of, of better growth in future. That's based on uh, some concrete reforms that have taken place, especially in the digital field, bringing down the costs of trade uh, and also making sure that there's a lot of emphasis on skilling and infrastructure. And I think the infrastructure part of it is driving a lot of growth in India today. Uh, but just not about it because there's an emphasis on exports, for example, and uh, the figure that has been talked about today, $1 trillion uh, eventually for exports in the near term. For that to happen, you have to have labor intensive exports uh, going up in a much better way. Uh, and for that to happen again, manufacturing becomes the key. So, you know, schemes like the production LinkedIn incentive scheme that the government of India has uh, put forward now uh, for some years, uh, they seem to be catching on and uh, seem to be gathering success. Uh, and eventually, because people will need to be skilled and they will be able to be employed in the manufacturing sector, so the future looks good as far as India is concerned. I was quite impressed by the figures which have been thrown up in, as far as Greece is concerned as well, because uh, you know it seems to be uh, a steady growth going forward, um, at least 2.3% to 2.5% in the next two years. And that's again, um, a lot of uh, credit should go to the government for undertaking some meaningful reforms. Uh, going forward by 2027, when you have the structural development funds, 55 million euro will come in. And that's going to add something, one more percent at least to the GDP. Uh, but it's not just that. I think uh, in both countries, India and Greece, because of the confidence you have, uh, the stock market, which has boomed. And that regenerates the confidence amongst the people. 
uh, in themselves and in the country. Now coming to Asia, because I think we didn't cover that uh, so far, but Asia itself has uh, invested a lot in technology, in e-commerce, and in linkages in intra-regional trade. And they've done so because they saw a crisis which is looming ahead as far as Europe is concerned, as far as the United States, uh, China decoupling is concerned. So they've sought to remedy this by making sure that they have a way out of that future crisis. So Southeast Asia, for example, has invested a lot uh, in, uh, in technology. And I think uh, given the fact that uh, the region is very resilient, again, it's uh, on an upswing and the, you know, all estimates, including the one by Economic Intelligence um, Unit, says that uh, Asia will contribute 60% of the world GDP in the coming years, at least in this year. Uh, and in the future as well. So that's a big, big number. And that has been brought about uh, also because of the fact that uh, the Chinese economy has a lot of interlinkages with Asia, Asian countries. Uh, but at the same time, they want to reduce that dependence as much as possible after the moves towards decoupling, which have happened with the United States. And the same goes for countries like India, which want to concentrate more on manufacturing so that they are not dependent upon what happens in China in the future. So we have a, a movement towards uh, sort of self-reliance in Asia taking place, which uh, sitting here in Europe, probably we don't notice. Uh, when that happens, you have multiple sources of production which will spring up, and that will give more resilience, I believe, to the world trade and economics. Um, Finally, one point which, I, which you know, was touched upon but not, uh, not elaborated was the U.S. elections. Sitting in India, we don't see uh, much of a difference as far as we are concerned because there's bipartisan consensus in the United States on the relationship with India. Uh, so whichever uh, candidate sits in the White House won't make much of a difference to us because of that reason. But here in Europe, it's a very important factor because you have the whole transatlantic relationship with hinges on who becomes president in the United States and uh, what kind of policies are adopted, where there is friction going forward between Europe and United States, that's extremely important, and will have a whole lot of cascading effect on your politics and trade and the stance that countries in Europe take or Europe in, in general takes on some very important issues, especially the conflict, for example, which is going on in Ukraine. Um, I don't see any of these conflicts, frankly, lasting too long, which is again a different perspective from Asia than it is in Europe. Because from sitting here in Europe, one looks at it from the perspective of a near-term um, solution not being possible. But we in Asia feel that, you know, eventually, because it's having such a cascading effect on different continents around the world, that there's a lot of pressure to end these conflicts as soon as possible. Uh, and that's also our hope. And if that happens, then of course, uh, the world economy will go back on track sooner rather than later. Sorry, one last point, which I forgot to mention was about the IMEC. Uh, because we touched upon that, and Shishir explained that quite clearly as far as the importance of ports uh, and infrastructure is concerned. IMEC is not just about ports, though, because it's about also, as he explained, green hydrogen, but more importantly, a digital uh, connect between Asia, Middle East, and Europe. And along with that, there's also an electricity and, and power connect, which is going to happen. Uh, plus, when you connect the ports, as Shishir pointed out, you have also uh, railway lines to be developed. They do exist in certain sectors, um, in the eastern sector, not so much in the northern sector, for example. So there are a lot of challenges going forward. And now I come to the challenges both for IMEC and, uh, and also for the economy in Asia, for example. First of all, for the IMEC, 
uh, you have to make sure that you have 8 billion euro uh, to, to finance these projects. Where is it going to come from? I look at our colleagues from Eurobank for that. Uh, how is it going to happen? So countries have to sit down and brainstorm over it. Uh, we missed the deadline for IMEC because it's supposed to happen within 30 days of 60 days of the project being announced, which was announced at the G20. And obviously that happened because of you know the crisis which was happening uh, in Europe, and again the war which broke out in Gaza. Uh, so at the moment the Israelis uh, cannot contribute much by way of ideas or anything else, but preparations have to go on. And preparations have to go on between India and Greece in particular. Now coming to the challenges in Asia, you have climate change for biggest challenge. Skilling is another challenge. And making sure that people are gainfully employed is the last challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. You all bring up such excellent <coughs> perspectives and a lot of very important context to continue this conversation. Um, and you've spoken respectively about you know, Greece and India a little bit uh, secular, but I wanna bridge that conversation right now and talk about how currently are the Indian and Greek economies working together actively? And for 2025, are there any specific challenges that need to be overcome in order for continued success? To anyone, please. All together is impossible. All at the same time, please. Uh, all the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, open question to anyone. Well, let me say, make some remarks on that. Definitely, the relations between India and Greece have been elevated during the last two years. The joint declaration it was signed in um, India, paved the way for more cooperation in the future. But we have to make it more tangible and clear and concrete. And this, co uh, this relationship should not be influenced by other developments on a global scale. It has to be bilateral, but at the same time, it has to be somehow the door for India to come closer and deeper to Europe. So far, only China has made it with some of the European countries. We do not see China as a rival. <clears throat> On the contrary, we have our eyes and our minds open towards the world. I said at the beginning during my introductory remarks that we live in a globalized world. <clears throat> but coming back to our issue, the fact that we are here today, the fact that we give a follow-up to the very first conclusions of our better relations is very optimistic. But we have to do more in the future. As I said in the beginning, we have to clear the ground in order to have more investments to share expertise and knowledge, to start building relations of trust, because events like this are happening all around the world. What is the difference between this cooperation and other cooperations at uh, other uh, levels? So, I mentioned some sectors where we can do more in the future. Relations with governments is very important, but some governments, today they are there, tomorrow they will be there. We have to make this cooperation more uh, sustainable for the future. In other words, to be more institutional. Private sector can play a role, a very important role, because in both countries the private sector has uh, developed during the last uh, years. They are very powerful, but the governments should support. Let me remind you one thing, that nowadays the private sector has money, but not power. The public sector has power, but no money. So how can you put this situation uh, closer to each other? And uh, as I said before, to be more sustainable in the, in, in the future. So I'm very optimistic, especially in, the, uh, in areas like as I said, shipping and uh, defense. We can work together. I remember when I was Minister of Defense, I had started the cooperation with the Indian government uh, in order to exchange what we produce, because at that time we had a very important and powerful defense industry that it is not the case now. 
we have the ambition to start building it again. But India has a great potential on that. Talking about defense, we go back to what I said in the beginning. What is happening in the world? The world is in deep transformation. New zones of influence have started emerging, and the global stakeholders are trying to do more in this, in this area. You see the antagonism between Russia and the United States. Also the economic, uh, uh, I would say, conflict between China and the United States. So the world is in a phase of getting reshaped. This is where we must uh, uh, poison, poison our, our, our relations without being influenced by what is happening in, uh, in the world. And I believe that it is up to the governments to create this framework and to the private sector to do more in meeting each other. In certain areas, the private sector can take a leading role in these relations, doing more than the governments, because some governments are committed to other international, um, uh, let's say, uh, relations. By saying so, I would like to tell you something regarding the United States of America. Transatlantic relations between the European Union and the United States are very strong after the Second World War. And Greece's role is very clear on that. We maintain excellent relations with, with the United States, but this does not mean that we are not open to the rest of the world. Our diplomacy is a multidimensional diplomacy. Greece is a small country, but in some cases can play a more important role as it is defined by its size. And we cannot compare India with Greece. You know the, the anecdote. When uh, a Greek delegation visited India 20 years ago, uh, the leader of India asked the Greek Prime Minister, and, and in which hotel you stay? It's having only 8 million people. So you, are, you have approached approximately right now 1.8 billion or something like this. 1.4. 1.4 billion. And very soon we shall see India overtaking uh, China. But in our days, it's not whether a country is big or not, whether a country has adopted big or small policies. And Greece is very ambitious on that. That's why we have opened this door, and I'm sure it will be fruitful and constructive for uh, both sides. In the areas that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the situation is still complicated because, as I said, it was the catalyst for big um, political changes in Europe. But uh, I believe that there, an agreement between Greece and India in, uh, on migration and between India and the European Union, and there is where Greece can take the lead on that mm. to bring in closer India to Europe. As a uh, European Commissioner, I can tell you I have been traveling around the world. I have visited even neighboring countries to India. The relation was not easy. I don't want to mention countries here, but uh, I was going back to Brussels with a lot of flowers and nothing was done. The difference between, for instance, Pakistan and India is that in India you have reliable interlocutors. What you say, it is meant to be implemented. And migration is one of the top issues. We need Indians in, in, in Europe, uh, as I said before, Europe is an aging continent. We need more and more, but we have to create legal pathways for the ones who want to come to Europe mm. and stop illegal migration. Because irregular and illegal migration has provoked a lot of problems, and uh, uh, the European countries were not prepared for that. Because in the year 2015, Europe was taken by surprise. They didn't know how to manage it. Oh, the same was uh, with Greece. But the experience we have acquired during all these years have made us uh, more clear on what we want from the others and what we can do in order to create, as I said, legal avenues for the ones who want to come to, to, to Europe. And the first ones that are more than welcome in Europe are the citizens of uh, India, of this great country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any thoughts? Can I, can I just add a, you know, one or two points to what has been said? A lot has been covered, of course. But I think yesterday when we were having a panel discussion on the relationship between India and Greece, uh, one important point 
which everybody agreed with was that uh, we must have direct air links between the two countries because that helps both trade, investments and tourism. And of course, the, the free trade agreement between India and the EU uh, would definitely help in bringing down the trade barriers. But that's something we have to negotiate with all the European Union countries. It's not in the hands of Greece. Of course, Greece can help a lot in that respect. Uh, but air links are extremely important. And um, I think we, we covered the point about shipping and also the connection that India seeks between its islands now uh, through ferries. And there, Greece has a lot of rich experience. That's an area to be concentrated upon in the near future. And the third area is that India and Greece, through once this migration mobility agreement is through, must prepare for the future implementation of IMEC. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it takes a long time to actually get into the act, and unless we prepare for it through a joint working group, uh, which is the most uh, convenient mechanism in this case, looking at all aspects of it, uh, and then Greece will certainly emerge as the true gateway of India into Europe. Mm. Can I add something on that? Please. According uh, to the United Nations High Commissioner, right now, there are more than 450 million people around the world on the move. Human mobility is the issue of our times. And this era will be mentioned in the future as the era of human mobility. Is the world prepared? Is the international community prepared? I remember I had met the former Secretary General of the United Nations and had proposed to uh, call on um, to, 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 to organize the uh, extraordinary assembly uh, of the United Nations on migration. All leaders met in New York. A lot of nice rhetorics, nice words, but nothing was done. Still, it remains one of the biggest issues. And we know what is defining, what is causing migration. Climate change, terrorism, persecutions, wars and dictatorships. And there is the problem. How can we uh, distinguish the ones who are migrants and they have to follow as I said, legal pathways and who are the ones who are entitled to be granted the, 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 the status of, uh, of a refugee? This is not clear, especially in, in, in Southern Europe and in Eastern in the Mediterranean. Nowadays, we have an increase of flows from Eastern Mediterranean. Flows have been stemmed from the so-called Central Corridor. Italy is not a destination anymore. But they all want to go to Germany and, uh, and uh, Sweden. But Germany and Sweden have changed their uh, the, the, the legal status right now. So they are not as friendly as they were before. What we have achieved here in this part of Europe, and I remember I had negotiated directly with the Turkish government, and we had signed the so-called uh, um, European Turkish Statement, Declaration. Uh, this cooperation gave results. The, flow, the flows were stemmed by Turkey for a long period till 2019. But the Europeans have understand that they must continue supporting Turkey in order to maintain in, within their borders approximately 5 million refugees. Most of them are Syrians uh, and also from neighboring countries. Now we have a new flow from Afghanistan because of what's happening in, in, in this country. So the situation remains very very complicated, and it's not only in Europe or in Eastern Mediterranean. We have refugees also from Ukraine, but also in Asia. You know what's happening in Sri Lanka and the other countries, and on the borders between United States and uh, and Mexico. So the whole world is on the move, and the international community is not there. There, India can play a role because it is a stable and democratic country, and this is what is shared with Greece. We are both democratic uh, uh, countries and we share the same values and principles regarding international law and humanitarian law. But in order to strike a balance between 
humanity and practical solutions to migration remains to be uh, addressed in the future. Excellent point, thank you. And we actually have a question at the front. If we have a microphone, please. Thank you, and can you introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, I think we began the day with a very interesting, insightful uh, discussion. Uh, Commissioner to you and Shishir and uh, Ambassador, uh, it seems to be a belief in many quarters that the European Union is part of the problem, not the solution. If you look at what EU has done, energy security heavily reliant on Russia, manufacturing and economic security heavily reliant on China. So basically you've uh, ended up uh, destroying a lot of the manufacturing in Europe, including in, in the industrial powerhouse of Germany. And if I look at defense security, heavily reliant on U.S., therefore, you know, the slightest change in the presidency of U.S. creates palpitations in every capital of European Union. So the question I, I uh, and India seems to be recognizing this, and we are, EU-India FTA is, is many, many years away, and now we've done an EFTA, with its, which is uh, with, with a small bunch of countries, uh, Norway, uh, Switzerland, uh, which happened much faster. We are engaging with NB8, which is Nordic Baltic 8. Uh, my question to you and to, to all of you is, does it make sense for India and Greece to be only looking at the relationship through the lens of Europe? You refer to it, Shishir. Why should we not look at a collaboration which has an impact beyond Europe? Let me tell you, for the reasons you explained before, we have to do it. It's very simple. I fully agree with uh, uh, what, you, what you say, but it is beneficial both for Europe and India to start working together on all these issues, the global, regional, and bilateral. But as I explained at the beginning, in Europe there is a problem right now, a deep political problem that has led Europe to live existential moments. because of what I explained in the beginning. On the other hand, we had a very stable democracy, which is India. In order to find a platform of communication and uh, cooperation, it is important to have a common understanding of where the world is moving towards. And this is not clear so far. So, first Europe has to make clear what is its strategic vision for the future regarding the relations with uh, the global stakeholders, including India. And from the other hand, on the other hand, India should continue coming closer to Europe. And actually, this is what we all said before. Uh, we must find gateways. Greece can be your porte parole to the European Union. Because Greece is not rival to anybody in the region. We always had excellent relations with other countries within the European Union, but also with Northern Africa, with Middle East, and in the region of the so-called uh, Balkans. And with India, eh, our past has, de has defined historically our today's uh, relations. So I'm optimistic, but on the other hand, I fully agree with your uh, remarks. It is not easy. It is important to know that it's not only your nice, friendly uh, rhetorics, but how can we put it in practice? And this is the role of the leadership at the European level, but also at the national level. It is good to, to, to know that uh, from the Indian side, there are very sincere uh, ambitions and intentions to come closer to Europe, because the world of the day after all this crisis will be a totally different world. <coughs> Ranjal, <coughs> sorry, can I Please. just add a bit? You know, but expanding your question, not just limiting it to the way India-Greece relationship, but expanding it perhaps to more the global south and at the, at the bigger, uh, you know, countries. One big obstacle still remains the lack of acceptance by some of the big countries that it's no longer a bipolar world. 
you know, you've got to deal with countries, whichever partners they would be in the context of India, or let's say, as equal partners. It's not a traditional relationship where all you did was imported the raw material and prevented any slight, any value addition from coming in. And in one of the papers, chocolates has been mentioned. It's so true. We lived in Switzerland for 25 years. You can import any amount of cocoa you want into Switzerland. Zero duty. Try taking it to the next uh, level of uh, value addition. What's that? Simple cocoa paste. And the duty goes up. And try importing uh, uh, chocolates into Switzerland. Impossible. So, okay, that's history. We need to look ahead as equal partners. Thank you. And also from the Indian perspective, I think uh, for us, it's important that Europe is not uh, facing diversions because Europe in India is considered a very important partner for development. Uh, we look at Europe as the United States as well, as a country which uh, can help the whole process of transformation. Uh, investments, technology, partnerships, mobility, migration, the whole package. Uh, and also the European involvement in the Indo-Pacific from the security point of view. India is quite happy to see Europe play a role and we're quite happy to see a number of countries first and then after that a whole European policy evolve over the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the reason is that we want Europe to be involved in that development. And so this war in Ukraine has actually diverted Europe's attention from what could have been a very quick solution in some cases to this partnership with Europe, uh, especially the investments in infrastructure in India, for example. Uh, companies in Europe who would have otherwise paid much more attention to that aspect uh, are now looking at what's happening within Europe itself. And the uh, FTA negotiations also obviously got impacted a little bit about uh, how the future will look like for Europe and how long would the war in Ukraine continue. So it's in all our interest to actually see that the conflict ends as soon as possible. Thank you, everyone. Tassas, any thoughts on it? Just a thought on that. I mean, either we're talking about bilateral relations or we're talking about a multilateral project as IMX is, for example. Apart from the strategic intentions, which are there, we know that they're there for more involved players. It has to make sense in economic terms as well. We have to remember that bilateral relations, economic relations, and multilateral projects <coughs> comprise of smaller but big projects that have to be uh, carried out, designed, financed, and they have to make sense, they have to be viable in the longer term. So instead of focusing on, on, on perhaps more uh, vague uh, strategic intentions, we should work on a more sectoral basis, on, a, on, a, on a, the nitty-gritty of the uh, economic transactions. And let me uh, try to draw a lesson from the uh, economic history of India uh, to, to, make, to make a point here. What made uh, India a very uh, uh, quickly growing power? It was a big internal market, yes. A competitive cost, yes. But this has been shared by other countries as well. What made India a special case was the fact that it invested heavily in its people, in, in research, building human capital and material capital, and institution building, starting from the Nehruvian years, and especially after the crisis of 1991. India uh, built democratic institutions, securalization, uh, liberalization of its economy, uh, globalized supply chains. I mean, you have to build institutions in order to grow. It's not just about the size. And I think uh, some other developing nations, but some European nations as well, have, have lessons to draw from the, uh, from the success story of the Indian economy. Thank you. Well, we've really, oh, yes? My, my name is Dupin Roy. I used to be the CEO of Dirard Consulting. Uh, we are talking about India and Greece in, in a business context. So, you know, whenever you talk about migration, the image of millions of boat people arriving illegally to a shore raises a political backlash. And economists will say that, okay, if you, if you allow, if I allow your goods to come in, why would you not allow my people to go in? I think that is not the issue. 
in India also, we oppose illegal immigration from Bangladesh or Rohingyas from Burma. So I don't think millions of Indians are trying to migrate into Europe. What we should, uh, instead of talking about migration, we talk about global mobility. I have a nephew who has got a manufacturing of furniture who has got a Danish CEO in India. So Indians will go abroad as business people with capital, talent, etc. Therefore, instead of migration, let us talk about global mobility of people, both sides. And the second thing I would like to say is that we are in a business context trying to see how we can construct migration digitally. India has been in the forefront. We have, you don't need to have, phys you, you know, what disrupts is physical people coming into your shows. Instead of that, our entire IT industry is making people electronically fungible. We do the work without actually physically migrating our people. So I think that is where India can also contribute and we should talk about global mobility of labor rather than migration because migration becomes very politically charged. Thank you. Thank you. And you should join the panel right after this, the hidden influences of the Indian diaspora. We're going to be speaking about that particularly. So it may be of interest. And so we really have uh, just a few more moments and we've really only touched the surface on all of these items, but I wanna thank you all for joining this and for sharing such interesting perspectives that are very relevant to the conversations that we're having today. And I apologize, there's, there's no more time for, for questions, but thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you for giving Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.